I sound kind of echoey, but I don't know why. Yeah. And and what is that crink that crackling noise? Probably me messing with the cord. So let me see if I can stretch it out. Yeah, that. I'll do that. <laughs> is it better now? Maybe just don't touch it. Don't don't touch it. Okay, it's on my face <laughs> or near my face. I just try not to move my head or breathe. This is Control Structure, episode 133 for September 2nd, 2017. Big, huge week, or month, or whatever to everyone listening. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs133 to see them. I am uh, one of your hosts for uh, today, uh, Andrew Bailey. And with me today is Stephen Orvis, the other guy. Hi, Andrew. Hi. So, um... It's been a little while, uh, but yeah, a lot has happened. So uh, I guess we can go ahead and get into this. Uh, the eclipse happened. It did happen. I, I heard you had a, a good front row seat for that. Uh, yes, I did. So let's see. <clears throat> yeah, the eclipse on the twenty uh, first of August, I believe. Uh, so, like in the week or so heading up towards it. I essentially, you know, like I wanted to drive somewhere. So either that would be like down towards like Greenville, South Carolina, or maybe over towards like Nashville. So in the week before, I was, uh, you know, sort of like watching the weather reports and stuff. And it seemed like either one would probably do. But then I remembered, uh, uh, you know, it was like, oh, well, I know someone over there. You know, like I might, you know, go over there to, like, spend the night or something. So it was the day before, at, like, 7 a.m., I drove out of Pittsburgh uh, and uh, drove all the way down to uh, Louisville. You know who's in Louisville, right? Utah, Chris. Uh, Who would that be? Utah, Chris. Utah, Chris. Chris, okay. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. So, uh, yeah, the the, uh, other Chris on the show... That uh, hasn't been on for a while, but uh, yeah, uh, went over and stopped and saw him, and uh, you know, you know, met and you know had a good old time there. Uh, spent the night at his house, um, and uh, he uh, let's see. Before I left, he asked, uh, you know, do you have any spare eclipse glasses? And it's like, well, I I do, so. Uh, my company apparently sent out eclipse glasses to everyone, so uh, like we could go outside and like take a picture during the eclipse or something. Uh, but I somehow managed to get two pairs. So uh, then, let's see, yes, I did test them uh, because apparently, uh, am- like a f- like lots of counterfeit glasses apparently entered Amazon, so they like recalled all of them. Uh, did you hear about that? I, I did read that article about that. I believe we have that in the notes someplace, don't we? Uh, yeah. Show? Yeah, the glasses recall there. The, uh, so so can you test them without uh, without looking at them? Or are you saying you tested them by putting up against the sun and like, nope, I didn't go blind? Uh, well, initially what I did was, like, turn on the lights, like, just inside and see if I could see the lights through them, and I could not. So... You know, that gave me confidence that it's like, okay, well, you know, close your eyes, put the glasses on, then just like quickly blink while looking up. And like, I did not get blinded by doing that. So, (laughs) so, you know, it was just sort of like a, like an orange, you know, disc in the sky. So like, wasn't like overly bright or anything. So I'm like, yeah, these are okay. Uh, So uh, gave that, uh, gave those to him as thank you for letting me into your house. Uh, but, uh, he apparently needed to go to work that day. He did not not take it off. So from there, I went to Russellville, Kentucky, which is a little Southwest of Bowling Green. So if you know where Bowling Green, Kentucky is. No. Okay. Well, do you know where Louisville is? Uh, not actually. Okay. Wow. Uh, so, so to you, I was like literally out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, basically, I was—I was, I knew where the curve is of the uh, 
you know, the, where the eclipse slide was. So I figured you yeah. someplace in, in someplace along that curve. Yeah, so you at least know where Nashville is, right? I've heard of it. <laughs> Knowing is different than hearing, though. Okay, okay, so, uh, yeah, I think, I think maybe uh, looking at a map, at least for your sake, would help. Yeah, that that would that would make it better for me. So, uh suffice to say I was uh sort of between Bowling Green and Nashville, uh maybe a little bit west of there. Uh so I drove there and uh like I I wanted to uh, uh go to I think it was like like a tennis court or something that uh you know like they would have spaces for like twenty dollars and some something and you could go in there and park uh so like I eventually uh found where it was and apparently the library which is like across the street from there was holding a huge party and like there were signs and everything um but like as I was driving up towards the place uh like it was going to open at nine o'clock and it was like ten after nine. So I'm thinking, oh, great, it's probably, like, already full by now. So, like, I'm probably going to have to, like, you know, stand around in some parking lot somewhere. But uh, I pulled up to the library there, and there's, like, there's an extension lot down the road, and there's a shuttle. Uh, So I'm like, okay. So did that. And, uh, uh, by the way, I had encountered pretty much every construction zone known to man between Pittsburgh and this place. <laughs> oh, that, that's how that stuff goes. Yeah. So uh, the main interstate bridge across uh, Cincinnati, across the Ohio River at Cincinnati, that was closed. So, uh, yeah, that, that caused a little bit of a problem in Cincinnati. Uh, but before I navigated through that, I stopped and uh, got a pizza, so at least, like, when the traffic stopped, I could, like, chomp some pieces of pizza. Uh, so that kind of, you know, like, mellowed that out a little bit. So I was having lunch at 10 miles an hour versus having lunch at, like, <laughs> 70. Uh, so uh, anyways, uh, then there was, like, a bunch of construction halfway between Louisville and Bowling Green, where it went from three lanes down to two, so that made everything stop. Uh, but... Uh, and generally, if I was not in a construction zone, I was about 50 miles from one. So, yeah, it, it, it was, uh, you know, not as fast as I hoped it would be. But uh, anyway, so I get down there, uh, you know, pack up my, uh, you know, backpack, because uh, I didn't really consider the fact that I would have to, you know, leave the car somewhere. But, you know, I packed up, you know, the essentials and... Uh, pretty much sat around in the lawn of a library uh, for, like, three hours before it actually started, like, before the uh, moon started Mm -hmm. sliding over the sun. But, uh, uh, you know, it was, like, about 90 or 95 degrees, but there was, like, a little bit of breeze. So it wasn't... I was not drenched in sweat. It was kind of nice, actually. So, let's see, about... Yeah, about an hour or so in... So, like, about 30 minutes before totality, I noticed that, uh, like, it was, tw- you know how it's, like, 20 degrees cooler in the shade? Like, under a tree, it, it can be cooler in, under a tree? Yeah. Uh, by, like, an hour or so into it, you could not tell. Like, it, everything was just, just kind of cool. And it was around that time you started noticing that everything just started to dim. <clears throat> like, not not, like, a storm cloud coming in dim... Just like someone turned down the dimmer switch on the sun. <laughs> so, uh, and I started, you know, wondering, it's like, well, I didn't bring any kind of like pins or anything to like make a pinhole projector. Cause like you always see those during eclipses and you see like little crescents, you know, mm-hmm. like where these spots should be. But like I didn't, you know, think that far ahead or anything uh, for that. Like, then about 15 minutes before totality, uh, like, that's, like, it was, like, really dim. Like, you would have to be blind in order to not realize that, you know, things are starting to, like, get a little dim out here. Uh, And it had really cooled off. And you can kind of see, like, this one, uh, you know, article 
you know, posted how, uh, you know, it gets cooler sooner than it gets dim. That was pretty neat how we were saying how the, our eyes can pick up on the light very well, uh, but whereas the coolness, you feel the coolness in a more realistic way. It was interesting. Yeah. Um, so about 15 minutes before totality, I looked down and I was wearing a uh, like a straw hat like the entire time. So I was kind of accidentally wearing a pinhole projector and there was like <laughs> little little crescents like all around my arms and shirt like I was wearing the eclipse. <laughs> it it was pretty sweet. So I like I like I you know uh you know walked around and was like sh- you know showing everyone, "Hey, look at my arm." <laughs> <laughs> so okay. Yeah. Glad you had fun with that. <laughs> So yeah, I was like snapping pictures the whole time, and uh, so you just took selfies the whole time. No, <laughs> like I actually had like a nice DSLR camera, so mm-hmm. I was like you know walked around and walked around the whole library. There was, I want to say there was maybe about five hundred people there. Um, so like you know they they had like a community event thing going. They had fans with misters. And I think, like, the local Aaron's rental shop had, uh, like, tubs with, like, bottled water and ice. So, and I think, uh, like, someone pulled up, a like, a food truck in the uh, parking lot. Uh, like, there was, like, a little strip mall beside it. Mm-hmm. So, but I had, uh, <laughs> I had packed pizza, <laughs> uh, which, uh, you know, which apparently, I didn't know this, but as a side job, uh, Chris also delivers for Papa John's, so he had like oh. five pizzas in his fridge in various uh, uh, states of being eaten. So I'm like, "Hey, could I? Uh, would you mind if I took one of these?" And he's like, "Yeah, go ahead." <laughs> so uh, yeah, I had I had that back in the car, but the one I got in Cincinnati was like uh, was Donato's pizza. So like I had that like right there because it was better. Uh, but uh, anyways, so like when the time came, you know, like you could, uh, you know, start it. It wasn't uh, like in the pictures you see of totality, you can see like it was completely dark with just, just the ring of light around the sun. But in reality, it looks more like dusk or twilight or something. So like you could like sort of see like on one side of the sky darkness where like the path is coming towards you but otherwise it was just like an orange red like all around the horizon so like i had my glasses on and i could just see that little sliver of sun disappear and then i took my glasses off and what i saw was perhaps the most magical thing i've ever seen in my life like a hole where the sun should be <laughs> So you looked at the sun without the glasses on? I could not see the sun because the moon was in the way. <laughs> I, I thought that that was the point in time that was most dangerous to look at the sun because your eyes trick you that there's nothing there, but then you really go blind or something. Well, no, like I had, I was actually looking through the glasses and uh-huh. like the sun had completely disappeared. Okay. So like the corona is of the sun, you know, like I've known that... It's essentially the hottest part of the sun. Like, you'd think, like, the center part of the sun is the hottest part, which kind of makes sense, and it actually is pretty hot, but, like, the atmosphere around the sun is actually hotter. It's it's one of the, uh, how should I say this, one of the uh, unsolved physics questions. Heat goes up. Everyone knows that. Well, <laughs> <coughs> you'd think so. But, like, if you get further and further away from your source of heat, you start to cool down. Mm. Uh, so, you know, like, there's something, like, agitating, like, the gas around the sun that causes it to warm up. But, uh, like, all the gas flowing away from the sun goes along these magnetic lines. So, like, you can see, like, these faint wisps, like, overlapping, like, spreading out away from the sun. And that's, like pretty cool thing the other thing is that's always been there but you can't exactly see it 
So you can see like the wisps and things around the sun when it's in that state like that. Yeah, when it's eclipsed. Ah, that's pretty neat. So like that ring you see like for eclipses, mm-hmm. like that's overexposed. Like there's quite a bit of detail in that. So, you know, like I sort of stared at it for, I don't know, 20 seconds before I started taking pictures again. But, uh, yeah, like everyone was, uh, like, at first people started gasping, but then people started cheering and, like, you know, essentially going, whoa. So, uh, yeah, that that was a a fantastic sight. And then, uh, like, have you ever heard of the diamond ring effect? Diamond ring effect. I may have heard of it, but I don't exactly remember. What is it? So that's that's the like second before and the second after totality, where uh, like the sun is just breaking out from behind the moon. Mm-hmm. So like the sun itself is incredibly bright. So like you only need just a little tiny bit of it to like start overwhelming everything. Uh huh. So, like, that's the diamond part of the diamond ring effect as the moon slides either over Ah. or, you know, away from the sun. I see. You still have, like, that ring of light around the moon, but then suddenly you get, like, a really bright light from one part of the... Yeah, that just starts flaring up. I see. So, uh, yeah, that that was uh, a really cool experience. Uh, The, uh, how should I say... (sighs) The, uh, oh, I can't exactly describe it. The, how should I say, the wisdom of just suddenly getting up and going there is a little bit questionable. But considering, at least for now, it's a once in a lifetime thing, I'll eat well, that. <laughs> I, I, I heard up in Erie in seven years, you can go up and see it then. Um, yeah, up until then. But, okay, can... once in a lifetime, up until then. Okay, fair enough. But, <laughs> But, uh, you know, considering, you know, this is, you know, the Great Lakes, we're considering Ohio, Pennsylvania during April, probably going to be cloudy. Mm, that could be. Yeah. But uh, we'll, we'll see in like seven years or whatever. So, you know, of course, like after, after the whole event, you know, everyone starts going home and, you know, I pull on through the freeway and stuff. Um, then start driving up to mo- to my parents' house, uh, like around Columbus, and you know, of course, you know the construction's still there. Uh, but I eventually make it to my parents' house uh, before one a.m. So yeah, I-, I took both that Monday and Tuesday off. Imagine the traffic would be bad with everyone going to see it. Oh yeah, like the. Uh, like I, I reached Cincinnati about 10 o'clock or so and like the freeway was still full. Wow. So, uh, yeah, then, uh, let's see. It was, uh, the other programmer at my company. Apparently he went down to like the Smoky Mountains and stuff. And he, uh, let's see, uh, him and some of his buddies, they, uh, like did a four mile hike or something up to this ridge. And just as it was about to happen, it started raining. (laughs) So, yeah, he he really didn't get to see the show, though. So, um, yeah, there were, uh, like, the people sitting around me, you know, I just, you know, started talking to them. And uh, there was a sort of a older couple from, like, between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore Mm -hmm. that... uh, uh, like the wife, she was uh, like a some kind of nurse. I'm not sure if it was an RN or like some kind of advanced degree or something. The husband was a former programmer for NASA. Oh wow! So, so I'm like, wait, uh, there w- there was a like a VIP tent out in the yard, like further out, and like apparently it was like sponsored by NASA or something. So I'm like, NASA? You mean like that NASA? <laughs> It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I asked, you know, if he worked on anything, uh, you know, famous or anything. He's like, yeah, I worked on Hubble for a while. And mm-hmm. uh, then I worked on uh, uh, Chandra, which is like the, he, as he described it, the X-ray equivalent of uh, Hubble, which, you know, I had already, you know, I knew what that was anyway. And uh, so I'm like, so... 
so uh, you were looking for black holes? It's like, yep, that's you know one of the things that it does. So then, yeah, maybe. let's see, there was another family there. It was like uh, grandparents and grandkids, and uh, let's see, they were they were from the Kentucky side of Cincinnati, if you could actually describe it as that, like the northern Kentucky area. And apparently that guy, uh, uh, like, you know, we were talking and he's talking about, like, going to the office or something. So it's like, what do you do? And he's like, oh, I'm just a software engineer. It's like, no kidding. <laughs> it's like, what, you too? <laughs> yeah. So, so he's like, oh, so uh, what do you work on? And I asked him if he had heard of Salesforce. And uh, he's like, yeah, I've been working on that, uh, like, taking training for about two months or so. It's like, well, if you ever heard, hear of something called Commerce Cloud, that's what I work on. So, like, I uh, there was also a, a map there of, like, put a star from uh, where you're from. And there was, like, a good cluster of about, I don't know, like, six or eight stars in Pittsburgh. And, uh, like, most of them was, like, from Kentucky and places north of Kentucky. And, like, there was, like, a few more scattered around elsewhere, but, uh, like, it was generally people north of Kentucky, north of where we were. So, I guess, uh, like, if you went, uh, further south, because, like, we were sort of, like, on the line, like, in the middle of totality, because there was, like, a 70-mile path, and Russellville was, you know decently in the middle of it so i guess if you went a little bit further south like towards nashville you get like a lot of southern people maybe uh but uh yeah so uh definitely uh if that happened again i would probably do it again but twice in the lifetime happening yeah which <laughs> which uh very very few people uh you know get to experience that mm -hmm. uh but, uh, yeah, the first eclipse in the contiguous United States in, like, 40 years. So, yeah, essentially a lifetime. Sounds, sounds like you had, definitely had a good time. Yeah, so the uh, totality was, like, maybe two and a half minutes or so. So that's, like, how long the sun was blocked out. Uh, the one in 2024 is supposed to be a little bit longer than that. Oh, really? Yeah. And wow. uh, my aunt lives up in uh, Norwalk, Ohio, which is, like, dead center on uh, the path of the 2024 eclipse. So, uh, let's see, I happened to call my mom when my when that aunt was down to visit her. So, I'm like, ask her if she's still going to be living in that house in about seven years. <laughs> she could probably sell tickets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that... That uh, will be quite an experience, and you know, you know, quite a few people will say it's like, "Oh yeah, I saw the eclipse from like somewhere outside the path," and they're like, "Yeah, it, it wasn't really life changing." It's like, well, you didn't actually see it. You know, I heard it described as you know seeing a partial eclipse, but saying that you've seen the eclipse is like standing outside of an opera house and saying that you've seen the opera if you get my drift there yeah because it because i did go outside and I, I glanced at it with the welding helmet and it like you're saying it's just like a crescent sun it's like okay yeah and the sun's kind of gone but it's not really dark out so uh anyways moving on to uh something a little bit more uh video gamey so you've heard of dota 2 right uh, yes, a uh, guy at work, actually a couple of guys at work are really into that game, so they're always always talking about that and, and uh, that, that genre of, of games. So the, that's been out for a little while, uh, but because uh, Valve cannot count to three, they've decided to release a collectible card game based off of Dota 2. Hmm. So the other famous three game uh, would be Half-Life Episode 3. Half-Life 2 Episode 3, or maybe even Half-Life 3 itself. Uh, but there has not been an installment in the Half-Life series for probably going on like 10 years or so. Uh, one of the uh, writers uh, from the Half-Life series has since uh, moved on from Valve because 
Uh, essentially, they can't really do anything except to make money anymore. They've they've stopped making games. And they've only make money now. But uh, he's released uh, Epistle 3 on his blog. And it's essentially a sort of plot line of how, like, Half-Life 2 Episode 3 would go. And it sort of goes like this. That's how the salt shaker got destroyed. Raspberry? 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 Raspberry! Have you ever wanted to be a, a telegraph operator? Not really. Have you ever wanted to be a ham radio operator and like talk to people in other parts of the world and like, connect with people from all over? Um, I used to, but I have the internet for that now. Yeah, I know the internet took all the fun away. Anyways, <laughs> uh, you can relive those days of yesteryear. Back when it used to be, the internet wasn't so much a thing unless you had a modem and had a friend who had a modem and you dial up with each other and talk to each other through that but nice modem to modem connection. Uh, now you can go back and, and, and do it the old way with the Raspberry Pi Telegraph. Uh, basically, uh, what it is, they've, they've just got a box, and they've got like a button hooked up to it. It's got a speaker in it, and a uh, Raspberry Pi Zero in it, and they wrote some software that uh, goes ahead and talks to a server uh, for some software that they wrote, and it has channels, and you configure in your Pi like, what channel you want it to connect to, and it just pretty much goes and links up with the server and registers that channel, and someone else registers that channel, or someone else's too, and they all hear hear the beeping when you make a beeping sound and you hear their beeping sound. So you can it's kind of kind of virtual virtual hand radio for you there. I see. But uh, I got I actually subscribed to the Make magazine just uh, like a month or so ago so I got my first issue today so that wasn't the first issue. So I was pretty happy. I was like that, that's, a, that's a pretty good project if it's going to be like this. This is, this is a good magazine. And yeah you get like a nice little box with a button on it. Mm-hmm. I was thinking that could be a fun one to 3D print, like a box like that. Because I actually have a, an official legitimate uh, telegraph key. So I'd probably, if I did it, I'd incorporate that with it. That's way more exciting than uh, a little fake plastic button on the top. Yeah, making uh, glue the buzzer down with a dot of hot glue to prevent it from knocking around the box like a poltergeist. <laughs> <laughs> of course, probably yeah. the sound... The sound being emitted by the buzzer will probably like make it vibrate around anyway. If you didn't, so yeah, interesting. Mm, yeah. That's so, true. Um, so, in other other Pi news coming soon to you is a Google Piebot. Uh, my 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 name there. Uh, they've released uh, a do it use of voice recognition that Google has. It has like your speaker and, and microphone and things in it. And you and suddenly. You suddenly have uh, oh. totally dropped in sound quality. It probably has something to do with Windows. I'm not going to name too many names there. It, is it better now? Uh, maybe, but maybe. it also sounds like uh, we're actually listening to you over a radio. It's quite staticky. See, this is like the retro Pi thing. <laughs> now you can see, like, we live a static on the radio now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, you seem to have okay. cleared up quite a bit. That's because so. that's I turned Windows Update off again, so until Microsoft turns it back on, we're good. Anyways, <laughs> Matt, the, the official Raspberry Pi, uh, the Magic Pi do use of projects thing, uh, is Google has a kit, uh, a voice kit for the Raspberry Pi, which comes with, like, your speaker and your microphone. I mean, not stuff you couldn't just go buy. You could go buy this stuff. And then, But I, I guess uh, currently Google has plans for other kits coming out. It says including, let's find who it is. Uh, soon, soon bring makers the eyes, ears, and voice and sense of balance to to allow simple, powerful device interfaces. So apparently Google has big plans for the Raspberry Pi. And actually, uh, it's kind of funny because it sounds uh, a little robot-like that they're, they're giving you the pieces you need to build a robot. So it's kind of, kind of neat. Cool. So, uh... You mentioned Windows back there. Yes, I did, unfortunately. 
So uh, Windows 10 Pro for workstations has been announced. Uh, it's essentially a high-end edition of Windows 10 Professional. And it sort of sits, uh, it essentially allows like more processors and more RAM uh, to be, I don't know, be used with Windows 10. Um, so like instead of, you know, having to buy like a server edition, like you can just pretty much use the same Windows 10 that everyone else uses. Uh, so you can take advantage of uh, four physical CPUs and massive memory up to six terabytes. So here's the big question that's a very important question, actually. Does this version of Windows 10 support uh, containers? Because that's, that's the big feature I've heard of the Windows servers coming out with recently that's going to be a game changer. And this needs to have containers if they don't have it. Uh, it does not look like it. Yeah, see, so, that's... Yeah, I don't... So the other uh, uh, thing that they're touting is support for non-volatile memory modules, uh, REFS, the resilient file system, and remote direct memory access capability for faster file sharing. So, so basically, it sounds like, were they wanting to shut down the computer and start it back up again and still have the program loaded in memory? Is that what they're trying to get up there? Maybe. So, like, I'm not exactly sh sure about the technology quite yet. So, like, I guess it might be more of, like, a Optane or 3D Crosspoint stuff that Intel is doing. Hmm. So, yeah. So, speaking about operating systems, uh, Dragonfly BSD has added support and tested support for over 900,000 processes. Important thing there is tested. Yes. Really impressive. The guy's, like... <laughs> He's like, it actually ran. He's like, it, it was a little bit laggy, but it did run, which which is impressive. You're really stressing your computer out and to actually pull that off. Yeah, so uh, just be sure that your process destruction does not involve a lock in kernel space. 900,000 processes waiting for a lock? Yikes. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a poke on Windows 10, uh, that the uh, bug that one guy discovered. Mm -hmm. So, uh, speaking of uh, high process counts and stuff, um, so I made a script that essentially uh, runs uh, uh, picture encoders, like image encoders for like JPEG and WebP. Like I wanted to like run all the possible settings and stuff and then choose, like go over them manually and choose the best ones. So like I wrote a script that essentially launches about... I don't know, eight encode tasks, uh, like, per quality setting. Uh, so, let's see, I think the quality settings I put was, like, from uh, probably 10 to 90 uh, times 8 or so for the various quality levels. Uh, so, you essentially have, like, 700, uh, you know, processes being created along with, uh, like, the command prompt windows uh, so you got, like, 1,500 processes running and then, like, all being destroyed in quite rapid succession. And I have actually noticed some lag with that, but it might also be, uh, like, the Windows shell trying to create, like, all the icons in the taskbar for all those windows coming up. What do you mean with the... So, like, you know how Windows creates, uh, like, a little icon in the taskbar for each window that comes up? Oh, okay, yeah, I got you. So, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty sweet that I think I can reproduce that. And it sounds like you're breaking up again. So, uh, oh, let, me, let me fix that. Yeah, AMD has finally released a Vega 64 and 56. They are, or at least were, priced competitively to the GeForce 1070 and 1080, but at a massive power consumption and heat generation. So... You know, like, I I was kind of waiting for this since I kind of, you know, want to get a faster graphics card uh, for, you know, the new games I'm trying to run, like Star Citizen. So, like, I was, you know, going to be patient and wait for, you know, whatever AMD put out and then, you know, decide, is like, well, what do I want to get now? Uh, well, apparently there's been exceptional demand for these new Vega cards, probably probably by cryptocurrency miners. And this has driven up the prices quite a bit. 
uh, to like 1080 Ti levels. Uh, so my advice is just get a 1080 Ti because the Vega 64 costs as much, but it's not as fast. So uh, Fizzle Fade is an effect used by old games, particularly Wolfenstein, that turns the entire screen red pixel by pixel. Uh, the uh, way it does this is, uh, let's see, I forget what it's called exactly, some kind of shift, uh, linear feedback shift register. Uh, so apparently these things is these things are a really efficient way to semi-randomly generate a sequence, uh, visiting each number only once. That i would seen that effect in games before. It's it's really neat. They were saying that uh, apparently the way it works, if you change the screen resolution, though, it doesn't work out quite so good for them. Uh, yeah, because it only uh, selects a fixed amount of bits. So for the resolution it runs at is like 320 by 200. So it grabs like the first nine bits and like the last eight bits or something. And if it and if uh, the numbers are within like the range of the screen resolution, it'll turn the pixel to red or blue or what have you. So the part I was struggling with understanding there, I was getting that they were XORing it in some way to know when the whole screen's red. Like that made sense. But the part that confused me was how they were the algorithm in between. Like that was kind of hard to understand. So it looks like it starts off like sets an integer to one and then like for every cycle it uh uh does like a left uh you know it would be a right shift Mm -hmm. and then if like that last uh number is a one it'll do uh an exclusive or with uh like certain positions in the integer so like you do a, a right shift and that you know sort of you know randomizes at those uh, certain bit positions. And then after, I don't know, probably several thousand or million cycles, it'll cycle back to being one. And that's how you know you've uh, started the sequence again. Oh, I see. Okay, so it's just that you're turning every so many op- every so many uh, positions, you're just flipping it every so many positions. Well, and then, as you said, when you cycle the whole way through, then you know you're done. Yeah. Okay, that makes so, a lot more sense. So, like, one, okay. one of these tables down here, like, it'll show, like, a sequence of bits and then the value. And, like, it essentially puts in a pattern of bits and then shifts them to mm-hmm. the right. And then it'll eventually cycle back to uh, the number you started with. Yeah, because eventually, eventually, as you're sh- putting them in and shifting them, eventually you hit the area that you've been shifting over from. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pretty neat. It's fun when you get into the the uh the binary stuff like this and how you can use shifting to achieve achieve things because that's at least for me that's the thing i don't normally use i mean you're so abstract you you don't even work with bytes so shifting is a kind of a foreign concept yeah so this this is uh i don't know this this guy apparently was going through like the old uh id source code and this is like one of the ones that he like you know, found that this was really cool. And, of course, the other one, which is a little bit more well-known, is the fast inverse square root algorithm. So, like, have you ever determined, like, how fast, like, base mathematical functions are? Like sine, cosine, and so forth? I haven't looked too much into the speed of them. So... Uh, apparently square root is like a very slow operation. Like it's three times slower than like a sine operation and like quite a bit longer than a division as well. So uh, like when you have to, let's see. So up at the top, you see a Q R S Q R T as a link. Let me bring it back up here. Yeah, that goes to the Wikipedia page that essentially describes you know what this is supposed to compute and like it's essentially supposed to like normalize a uh, a vector so like if you like have a vector going somewhere but you wanted to normalize it to a length of one like you need to do a few square roots 
but it's like one over the square root of like whatever. So this uh, fast square root algorithm essentially does a shortcut with uh, uh, like some kind of like a magic number. And uh, this was like popularized by the uh, like whatever quake engine. Uh, But uh, even, uh, you know, like a lot of people credited this to John Carmack, uh, but apparently Carmack did not uh, come up with this. It dates back further to like SGI uh, back in the 80s, which is like another cool algorithm uh, if you're if you're interested in like uh, doing hacks uh, like low level hacks, so that it's neat what the because he had limited resources, limited space constraints. The guys came up with back then. Maybe yeah, they think a lot harder, a lot more clever. Yeah, like whoever came up with this needed to like be a math wizard. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, do you remember Google Amp? Google Amp. Mm, I can't really say that I do. So it's essentially the uh, collection of fake HTML tags that you're supposed to use, uh, along with a few other things uh, that is supposed to like make a web page load fast. Uh, I think we uh, mentioned this. Uh, Google did it like about two years ago, uh, but uh, it's uh, essentially uh, bad for any site that is not strictly read-only. Uh, for instance, any kind of e-commerce site. So uh, essentially you can't really do any kind of forms so that you can't really log in or like even do a checkout. Uh, you really can't uh like do a newsletter sign up uh i'm pretty sure you can't really do scripts either so that is kind of restrictive in what you can do it's essentially a framework to make a web page load as fast as it possibly can this was the one that was reduced or something that supposedly they they didn't have as much right like it was simplified yeah so uh Apparently, eBay has done this. So, like, if you ever done a search for a product and it comes up as a result on eBay, mm-hmm. uh, that's, you know, there's, like, a like a sort of interstitial, interstitial page, and then you click somewhere, and then you go to the actual product page. So, like, apparently that first page is uh, AMP-enabled. So, apparently, that's how eBay can get away with this. Because they're mixing it and they're using some pages that are and some pages that aren't yeah so and this guy uh does a uh performance report on both the amp and the not and the not amp versions of pages and comes out with uh not really that much difference in uh, page load speeds so you get all these negatives for not really much benefit and i think uh and i think uh windows might trying to be updating again ha <laughs> Few windows. Uh, another thing that uh, is updating is Android uh, to 8.0 Oreo. Uh, they've apparently teamed up with Nabisco for this. So, so who's Nabisco? I didn't really recognize that. Uh, it's it's the company behind Oreo. Okay. So, like, continuing the uh, the Android code names of like being desserts and sweet things. So I guess they decided that oatmeal cookie was not really a a thing they wanted to name their operating system after. So Google went to (laughs) Nabisco saying, hey, can we promote your product with this? Oh, okay. Nabisco, okay. When you said Oreo, it wasn't the the company behind this software. Okay, literally the company that makes Oreo cookies, you're saying? Yes. Okay, I see that. So, uh, yeah, you mentioned that there is a whole bunch of emoji in this. Yes, I, I I found that interesting that that was the selling point of this new, great and 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 pretty operating system. It's like, yeah, this new emojis now. This is this great? And I, I remember I remember that's the selling point of iPhones when the new iPhone comes out. They like, yeah, look at these great new emojis you can use now. Like, <laughs> I don't know, that's to me silly. It's like, okay, that's that's how you're selling a new version of an operating system is the emojis it has. Apparently. Uh, so yeah. then there's, uh, another thing that's, uh, sort of important is Project Treble, which from what I've heard is sort of like a driver 
uh, standard uh, for Android that uh, hopefully will uh, allow uh, like f- you know future upgrades to be compatible with more phones because uh, right now like phone manufacturers have to code a specific version of Android to a specific model of device. So with like more portable drivers, hopefully, you know, that'll become a lot easier. I've I've heard that's been quite a big problem in the past. uh, And that's been a big reason why Google has moved so much stuff to the Play Store, they've said. So then you can just have more of the base operating system and less things. So this one, you're saying they're, they're trying to make the drivers themselves more portable, though? Yeah. So that's uh, one of the main points why, uh, for instance, my Moto E is stuck on Android 5. So, like, despite the fact that uh, Motorola Motorola, uh, said, yeah, we'll be supporting Android 6 on this. Uh, No, they didn't. (laughs) Because software always costs money, and, well, I'm selling a new phone, so why don't you just go ahead and upgrade instead? So, uh, we need to talk about Google. So Yes, about Google. Yeah. So do, do, I, do no evil slogan, right? Yeah, um, but what is evil? So it, It's relative. Yeah. Ap- what appar- it's defined as. Apparently. So, I kind of don't want to talk about this. It sh- you know, this should probably be on another The Nexus TV show, like TED, but... Google appears ideologically compromised. Due to its practically monopoly status in web search, phones, and email, among a lot of other things, uh, combined with its goals to organize the world's information, this should be addressed, or at least acknowledged, especially on a network filled with Google acolytes. So, about a month ago, uh, James Damore a programmer at Google wrote a memo and circulated it internally, titled Google's Ideological Echo Chamber How Bias Clouds Our Thinking About Diversity and Inclusion. It takes aim at Google's and, in general, the political left's sacred cows. Uh, Specifically, it disputes the idea that disparities in outcome is because of oppression and that discrimination against, you know, the common groups is the solution, and that no one can challenge accepted truths. Like, they can't even be discussed. Uh, This memo had citations backed up by actual science and was not speculation. And you also added in here. Ah, yes, it says a company too far to the left to constantly be shaking, decorating much less services, which kept in mind all the the many things that... uh, Google has has been dropping because they they believe in change and in in going on a new thing and it's not so much not so much uh, keeping keeping the old thing and being playing it safe. It was interesting because he's looking at this as a broad topic of both on a company philosophy level and then also politically because it's it's not just about politics. It's also about how people will think, how they view life, and uh, there's you know, there's pros and cons to each. And really, that a, a, maybe a mix is a good thing. That's what why different ideas are good and why he did this to start a conversation because he's saying that ideas are being suppressed. Uh, Just getting the one Google side, the one over left side is out there and and people aren't open to the other ideas to get the discussion and get good good interaction because that's where you get the most value is when both sides are kind of talking. Yeah, like uh, there's no competition in ideas. Exactly. It's competition ideas. That's that's a great way to uh, to put it yeah you know it's, it's essentially like capitalism you know the free market will decide you know which things are better uh but like he you know apparently at google that does not happen for ideas this, so this is really a, bro- a broader topic than just google though this is where the society is going at the this moment in time in general yeah. that that is a, a trend is well there's kind of the the way things should be uh like one of his points he's making in there is about just like how in IT in general 
uh, you know, there's more guys that are programmers and ladies. And he's saying that, you know, on the other hand, though, in the UI sites, sometimes there tends to be more ladies than guys. And he's talking, well, there's different personalities here. Ladies are more personable. They like working with users more so. Whereas the guys tend to be more of the prop solving the problem. And it's just a different way that we work. He's pointing out we, they want to at Google to be 100% even even and that's in general a trend in society is they want everything to be the same but we're not all the same yeah and he, he's, he's saying that we need to recognize differences and why people can be different it's not necessarily yeah. a bad thing like, yeah a, like whatever happened different. whatever happened to be yourself yeah every everyone's good at something different and i liked his his bell graphs that he had in there he was showing how how they like to put people in the different camps and just like a line graph he's saying really there's this bell graph of how people work and they overlap it a little bit and that's why you you, you see the overlap that happening it's not a, a boolean on off like everyone's different and there's always overlap of, of things like that yeah definitely so um you know he he specifically cites like a few programs at google that are like specifically for women and like don't allow men and like other things like that you know since you know Google says that you know they don't discriminate, well, they kind of do in some areas. It, it was interesting back when I was first going to college. I was looking for scholarships, and I discovered that it was really hard for me to get a scholarship because the requirements to get a good scholarship, you have to be a uh, female, you have yeah. to be a minority ethnic group, yeah, you have to be some something like low, super low, poor income. I mean, like I said that one, yeah. <laughs> But it's like all the things like you can't not be like the normal average person. They they, they were catering specifically to to a, a different demographic. They they were being discriminatory against the normal demographic. It was interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, it almost felt like you weren't welcome. I yeah, I, I didn't feel very welcome. They're like, yeah, you're not allowed to go to college because well, you know, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So. Uh, going on here, this memo was leaked. Uh, James Damore was summarily fired for spreading gender stereotypes. And to the eyes of many, this action validated his argument. So, like, a lot of higher-ups at uh, mm -hmm. Google were, uh, you know, pretty much, you know, pretty much fired, you know, off, you know, this is, this is discrimination, this is misogynistic... Uh, what not so forth and all the labels that leftists ascribe to people on the right um and you know pretty much fired him pretty much as uh you know his memo says you know uh, dissenting ideas are not tolerated here so that was uh one thing that happened another thing is that uh youtube has been on a cens a censoring streak and uh, as you know, Google uh, Google owns uh, YouTube, or or is it Alphabet now? Alphabet owns YouTube. Let's just call it that. You know, Alphabet. Forget about Alphabet. Yeah, Alphabet owns Google and all the other related Google things like YouTube. So uh, they've been on a censoring streak. Uh, it's decided that machine learning, pattern recognition, and AI are the future and the solution to all of its problems, but machines just don't understand. YouTube videos flagged as extremists are taken down, but misunderstandings abound, and, for example, videos from Middle East Eye are evidence of war crimes and are not promoting extremism, but those got taken down anyway. Uh, fortunately, things have, you know, gotten sorted out, but, you know, the threat of this, you know, is pretty much ever present now. Uh, so, by the way, covering up evidence of war crimes is itself a war crime. So, should Alphabet be held acceptable for this? Google holds a lot of uh, power now with the YouTube search search results, ads that they run, that they don't run. Like they're really in a position to be a major influence in society. Well, well, not just in that way, and we'll touch on that in like a moment. Uh, a slightly milder form uh, has emerged on YouTube called Restricted Mode. Videos, or even entire channels in Restricted Mode, will not be promoted, suggested, rateable, commentable, embeddable, or really anything except linked to and played. Uh, no discoveries, social features, or anything like that, just 
play the play the video. There will be like no other uh, like suggested videos on the side, just like very stripped down and minimal. Uh, so this is hit a lot of channels hard. So, for instance, you got the gaming channels, there's skeptic channels, conservative channels, like, pretty much all around. Uh, so, not only do do uh, YouTube creators have to deal with this, this is in addition to the ad apocalypse earlier this year. Um, are you familiar with that term? Um, so I haven't heard too much about the restrictive mode. Uh, I... I guess my, my good excuse is I don't watch YouTube. <laughs> 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 but I do. I do some, but not not, not so, a whole lot. So the ad apocalypse happened back in like February or March, and that's when a whole lot of advertisers left YouTube because uh, like their ads were being shown on things like uh, Islamic State promotion videos. Okay. So. So like other terrorists and like, you know, definitely bad things. So, you know, YouTube being YouTube and not doing anything, they didn't do anything. So the advertisers hiked up and left. So YouTube clamped down on things and like the ad revenues on every single YouTube video that has ads, like they were suddenly like less than half of what they were before. Mm -hmm. So just like generally going around YouTube, like people are pushing things like Patreon more. And that's a website where you can like sign up and say, I want to give this person like $1 a month or $5 a month. Yes. I actually, I use that site. I, I support the the maker of Octoprint, which I use for my 3D printer because she's quit her full-time job and she just codes that software now all the time. And so it, I figure if everyone gives her a dollar... And she has her full time software job, and and like it's great software, so it makes it worthwhile. So uh, another thing that's been happening is Google has banned Gab.ai's app from the Play Store. Uh, this is uh, so Gab is an alternative to Twitter. So you know, kind of short microblog messages. That's what <laughs> Gab is. And it sort of prides itself on being like extremely pro free speech and uh, hands off. But uh, apparently, someone looked at Gab and apparently found a lot of like neo Nazi accounts uh, and like other sort of you know bad and unpopular opinions on there, and uh, assumed that you know the entire uh, service is like this. So Google banned their app from the App Store. Uh, so, you know, this is, you know, being seen as, you know, uh, censoring conservative views. Because as it turns out, Twitter uh, does not really like conservatives all that much either. Uh, being another, uh, you know, uh, company in Silicon Valley. It's essentially, you know, you know James Damore there was, you know, complaining about, you know, the stuff at Google. But really this this uh you know culture is endemic uh or rather all around a silicon valley um so yeah. and as a side note uh not only has google banned gab's app from their app store apple has also banned gab from the apple store as well so that's just because a certain group of people has flocked to that platform uh that doesn't necessarily make that service guilty of having attracted those people, plus those people do still have... I mean, there's a difference between threats, like you aren't supposed to do threats in people. Like, that's one thing, or defaming character, that, that's one thing. But as far as just talking, it may be uncomfortable talking, you may not like it, but still, it's... Yeah. You don't want to, you don't want to get in the habit of, of infringing on, on people. Yeah, speech. another thing... Another thing is that if you engage with these kinds of people, you can actually, you know, change their views on things if you start mm -hmm. talking with them. That's true. You can can reason with them and be like, "Hey, I mean, that doesn't make sense. Have you thought about this?" Yeah. And here's I mean, something that sort of invalidates your whole thought process on this. So, and uh, you know, as you mentioned, you know, Google getting uh, a lot of power and influence in search. Well, they're actually funding, you know, think tanks and lobbyists and stuff. 
So Barry Lynn, an anti-monopoly watchdog working for New America, wrote a piece praising the EU's antitrust actions against Google. Uh, for reference, uh, like the EU has actually fined Google over their uh, like shopping promotions, like how uh, the placement of you know the uh, shopping results are sort of like at the top of the page. Uh huh. Um, but uh, you know the EU has fined Google over this, so uh, Barry Lynn you know sort of praised them for doing that. Uh, Google and its CEO, Eric Schmidt, are some of New America's biggest donors. And that's like the think tank that Barry was working for. Uh, soon after he was fired, uh, the foundation's president said that the decision was in no way based on the content of your work, yet he was asked to just think about how you are imperiling the funding for others. Yeah, that, that kind of seems to be a strong tie in there. Yeah. So, you know, essentially, you know, presumably Schmidt or someone at Google, you know, called them up and said, hey, uh, what are you doing? You know, like, don't, you know, publish this. That's not what, you know, we want you to do. So he got kicked out. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, like an article, you know, about uh, actually from Barry Lynn himself. I, I think that was the one I got to see just a little bit of where he was talking about that people are afraid of Google now that that's becoming a thing because they're just so big and there's getting to be some fear there. Yep. So uh, this has been quite a long time ago, but back when Google launched Google+, Plus, it was rumored that Google was going around asking like large news sites, for instance, you know, Forbes, New York Times, and like other sort of content-based sites, uh, to add their plus one buttons or risk moving down in the search results. So uh, Kashmir Hill apparently wrote up an article, you know, essentially explaining this uh, and published it, but apparently Google got mad because this was apparently uh, confidential information, but that was never communicated to her. Uh, so... Uh, under pressure from her superiors, uh, she took the article down and she says that is like the one thing that I will always regret doing. So, so, that, so that's interesting that uh, uh, even way back then, like you said, that was quite a few years ago when they introduced Google Plus that Google was still, still doing that, but we haven't really heard too much of that. Uh, it kind of takes time for things like this to service, so sometimes... Kind yeah. Of so, yeah, I'm not sure if anything should be done about this. Uh, there are several alternatives to Google and its products. So, you know, definitely I would, you know, I'm starting to look into, you know, moving off of Gmail, which is something that I've wanted to be doing ever since, you know, we knew that the NSA was actually looking at it. <laughs> hi, NSA. Yeah. Hi, NSA. How are you doing? So, you know, I've stopped using Google Search. I now use DuckDuckGo, uh, which I'm not sure if uh, we've mentioned it, but apparently there's a billboard for DuckDuckGo in Pittsburgh. I think you did tell me about that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I've uh, snapped, you know, pictures of it. it you can see it. Uh, I think it's like next to the Parkway East, just east of downtown. And I've actually started using the DuckDuckGo on my phone, and I found it's okay on my phone. I still haven't quite, like, I think I tried the desktop a few times. Still not quite sure if I'm I'm uh, quite quite where I feel like the, the results are or what I'm used to getting. Yeah, like, I really don't care at this point. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, I can't even tell you how infrequently I use Google like how many times I have to switch over it's like so rare see I, I feel like it's probably learning that search engine and kind of being used to how it's going to act for you yeah and, uh, which that's been nice for my phone because I don't Google too too much on my phone it's mostly simple stuff and so it hasn't been annoying but I, at the same time I've been getting kind of used to it some yeah you know after 15 years of coaxing Google to you know give it what you want <laughs> Yeah, basically. So, the Google algorithm has changed my mind. 
There's the uh, submit uh, feedback link uh, right there on the uh, uh, show notes page. If you want to send feedback to uh, to us, uh, we'll go ahead and read it on on the uh, on the show, unless you ask us not to. Uh, and don't forget that today is International Backup Awareness Day, because someday you might uh, go into Gmail and uh, see that. Uh, you know, there will be no email. There will just be a, a notice saying that you violated the terms of service and we're shutting you off now. So uh, go ahead and back up all your stuff. Google takeout. Yes. And uh, yeah, I guess it would be uh, convenient to uh, include that link. So uh, yeah, you're not going to be coming back here for a while, huh? Uh, not, not for a while. It, it kind of depends upon how things go. I. Uh, I mean, eventually I'm bound to come back at some point in time, but whether or not it would be a, a good night to drop fire that we see. But hopefully we get back in a regular cadence and get sprinting and, and then we can get back in our, our normal normal every other week week thing. Yeah, so then uh, there's that. And then, uh, yeah, so Zach and Rachel have uh, hightailed it off to college, so they're up in Titusville right now. Um, yes, I, m- I remember you saying about that. What was it they, you said that they were trying to get away from? Was it the winter or something? Washington. Washington? You know, okay. Washington, PA. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, I think the environment would be largely the same. So mm. I'm not sure if they've, uh, you know, uh, you know, improved on that front or not. So if it sounds like we're, you know, sort of slowing down, it's because it's past midnight. <laughs> might have something to do with it yeah so uh yeah uh yeah everything's you know being held down here okay uh i was uh you know uh, my company uh just released uh shields uh just put that into production launched that like a week ago and that largely seems to have gone off okay so like i should not be working uh overtime much anymore that's a, a shopping website I took it? Yes. Okay. I'll go ahead and include the link there. And I've been uh, working my way through uh, StarCraft Remastered. It's uh, pretty much exactly like uh, the first one, except uh, someone upped the resolution and made things a little shinier. Then, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Star Citizen version 3.0 uh, should be out maybe in a month or two. Maybe. So, you know, that's the uh, the space flight game that I was oh, uh, showing you. Yes, yes, I remember you showed it. Yes, yeah, so it's going to be expanding quite a bit. And uh, there was, like, a huge game show, uh, like a game expo over in Germany, I think. And they showed off, like, all these cool features. Like, uh, uh, it was kind of like face tracking, but, like, it figured out, like, where your eyes and mouth is, so... It can, like, map lip sync onto in-game characters. So it's got, like, a webcam sitting there watching your face. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Huh. So your expressions, like, if you're surprised or you're angry or whatever, would show through and yes. you know, other people can see see what you... Wow, that's, that's pretty neat. Yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, put that video uh, in there. So, yeah. Uh, and aside from that, uh, have a good one. Watch for cars. <laughs> you too, Rizia. We'll